too much, Harun. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Zaman. I am one of the project manager of the Global Peace Champions. And it's my privilege and pleasure on behalf of the Global Peace Champions to welcome you all here in, the, uh, in our virtual workshop. Uh, we are delighted to have you with us uh, to participate and share your knowledge and experiences. Thank you for joining us in today's validation workshop. Uh, this uh, virtual validation workshop of the policy for the research in the virtual workshop engagement of the Global Peace Champions. Uh, Global Peace Champions will bring together both state and non-state actors working within the sector of women, peace and security from all continents with the majority from the Global South. So together with the key experts, uh, we will validate uh, these documents and together brainstorm key takeaway, a lesson learned and recommended areas on uh, focus for kind of activities uh, that should be coordinated at the uh, global level and also suggest topics for the second Global Peace Champions conferences to be hosted uh, in November, December, and December 2021. Uh, we are honored to have our special guest, uh, Ms. Uh, Gerald Echo from the uh, Arigato International. And also we have uh, Ms. Uh, Wilma Sorry from the Post-Conflict Research Center. We have Susan Oweiro uh, from the Partnership for Peace and Security. Uh, and uh, finally, we have uh, Rachel uh, from the Youth uh, Film Platform uh, Africa and the Film Village of uh, Kenya. Uh, so through a virtual roundtable discussion, they will critic and discuss uh, four key gaps and share an opinion on how these peace builders can use such a document as a tools uh, for the group's purposes. All of the more esteemed uh, yeah, Harun, can you, you can mute him. Uh, yeah, uh, so all of them are uh, the esteemed uh, specialists in the area of women, peace, and security. And before I, I hand over to uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, um, our program manager, uh, Mr. Harun, from the Global Peace Champions, who will outline the today's, uh, who actually already outlined the today's uh, virtual event. So I want to say once uh, more on behalf of the, uh, my respectful colleague uh, and the professional team, uh, Ms. Ruth, Ms. Zani, Ms. Munini, and Mr. Simon, as well as our partners, welcome you here in our uh, validation uh, workshop. It is, a, it is our wonderful to have you all in today's validation workshop. Workshop, thank you so much once again. And uh, now Arun, you can uh, proceed. Now the uh, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Zaman, for the brief uh, welcoming remarks. Uh, now we will do a quick presentation for the, for the, for the, uh, for the session. Will uh, let me handle. Are you with us? Yes. Okay, okay. I'm just opening for you the presentation. Give me a few minutes, please. So, Andrew, you can take over. Thank you very much, Haron. I 
have to put a disclaimer that one, I'm in the field, so I may not be able to open my video. And then from time to time, you may hear a little bit of noises here and there, but I try my best to just do this. My name is Andros Osamba, and I head an organization called Luzalendo Africa Initiative. And I am very passionate about WPS and also YPS. And, and, and that is the reason why I would like to present these findings because it's actually a part of the work that I love doing. Uh, so I will go directly to the to the to the policy brief. Harun, you're going too fast. Could you could you put the the first page? Could you put the heading? <laughs> Yes, thank you. So this is the insight on the gender agenda 20 years later. So basically, we are looking at 20 years after the WPS was actually passed. So I am not going to read everything that is in this position paper, but rather give, give uh, a little bit of highlights, but maybe you can benefit from the introduction. And it says, since the year 2000, when the UN Resolution 1325 affirmed the importance of women uh, relates to, to conflict and peace resolution and peace building, then in the last 20 years or so, its existence uh, concerns have progressively seen the inclusion in peace efforts at the national and international level, with the Security Council adopting several um, several resolutions, like you can see. But our key concern for today is actually WPS, which is UN Resolution 1325. And we're looking at women participation in the security. What does it mean for women to really participate in the in the in the peace and security sectors from all levels if for example we are talking about um the local level does it mean then if women have roles in the peace and security sector then they have fully roles or they're meaningfully engaged or do we put women at the spaces just to tick the gender box so that is basically what this uh, policy brief is is looking at Aaron, if you could go i am just avoiding to read the entire thing, but I can read the, the one in the in the red uh, bullet. So in the last 20 years of its existence, uh, Harun, <laughs> you, you're making me get lost. Okay, please put, put the red, yeah. In the last 20 years of its existence, and now we are talking about the existence of the women, peace and security, and I don't know why Harun keeps keeps taking me so fast. So I think this, this position paper is actually divided into three sections. And also the key recommendation for policy are divided into different actors. Their recommendation for the government, their recommendation for the non-state actors, and their recommendation for peace partner. So for instance, the gender focused capacity building initiative pillar is more on to contribute to the to women meaningful participation in peace and security seminar training and workshop. What we are saying is we need to build more capacities for women in peace and security sector. Harun, could you go? Could you go to the next, uh, but don't go too fast. Could you just take it up a bit? <laughs> yeah, 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 I want to read something here. So there's this part that says, uh, even though, Harun, you have to be still. So even though the care has to be with prepared men, experience has, sh has shown that unprepared uh, are less likely to contribute to proceedings and, and, and wanting um, into self-confidence. So if we're talking about building the capacities for women, women uh, in the security sector, then we need to redefine what, what is this capacity that we need to build? Because sometimes it is much more than just the knowledge on peace and security. It is much more, it has much more to do with confidence because we understand that women have to work extra hard when they leadership position and especially in spaces where traditionally they are, pre, they are preserved or they are known to be spaces held by men. Thank you, Harun. Please go to the next. Uh, so then there's the bit of strategic engagement with diverse platform of actors. Uh, so, so the existence of organizations and networks supporting women participation is a key factor that contributes positively to peace and security processes. Through this, uh, there has been
Sorry, Ant, we cannot hear you. Hello, Hans, we have lost you. Hello, sorry, Eva. I can I I can take over as I wait for um to come back. So, uh, so another part of the policy brief, we were looking at uh, strategic engagement with the diverse platforms and and actors, and these were some of the key findings from the old session, from the all the conversations during the virtual workshop. So these are some of the issues which were raised by by our key experts and key participants during the, uh, the workshop which we hosted last year. So as you can see, uh, the policy brief is so, in, it's so impressive with a lot of knowledge uh, uh, for those who are still junior in this part of this part. Also, we dive deeper in matters of women, uh, women in mediation. And the women in mediation, these are some of the few things we managed to uh, to capture. We realized that uh, when it comes to soccer, uh, women and children are the ones who are mainly affected. But when it comes to mediation, to uh, and com and matters of conflict, um, uh, majority of women and, and young people are not included. So our question was more of how might we ensure that women and young people are fully engaged? And, uh, and this part of the women in mediation is really in the, in, the, in the areas of Middle East with an example of Afghanistan. So you can see these are some of the key issues captured. These are some of the key ideas captured uh, by, by some of the participants during our virtual workshop in October 2020. Also, another, another, another key pillar we consider is gender responsive uh, in alternative dispute resolution mechanism. Also, we think more of how can we use uh, traditional dispute mechanism to solve some of the key, uh, key challenges within the sector of British security at the local level. So we managed to capture some of these pieces. You can see them, and some some of the good practices from from uh, from our experts also. Another part was more of bridging the intergenerational gap. We came to realize uh, young women they have double disadvantage. One because they are uh, the, uh, the youth. Two, also because they are women. So we realize there is a high uh, intergenerational inter gap between young people and some of the experts within this field. So this part, we trigger conversation more in how best we can, we, we can promote intergenerational gap. How can we link uh, our upcoming young people who are doing something amazing within the sector of British security and link them with some of the experts. Also, it was more of, it was, uh, it was more of mentorship within, within the sector of peace and security. So these are some of the issues captured during that session. And these were some of the main outcomes for the session. So I will go direct to the recommendation. We managed to come up with, with around five recommendations. One is the recommendation to women. So the recommendation to women, these were some of the recommendations which were, were brainstormed during the last day of our, of our workshop last year, October. So you can just review them. Though later some of our experts, they will get back 
uh, uh, they'll get back with more information in this part. Also, we managed to come up with recommendations to men, and our questioning was more of what's the role of men uh, in, the, in, the, in the sector of women's social security, because we came to realize that uh, men are not really engaged in the actualization and the localization of the United States 1325. So these are some of the recommendations of what men can do also to promote this resolution at the local level, at the national level, regional level, and international level. So we, we captured some of the best and good recommendations which, which were arrived by some of our experts from both genders. So we were more of gender equality in the sector of political security. Our another another recommendation is to the community. In this, we focus more on, on promotion of dialogue at, at, at the local level. Also, we we focus more on issues of of, of creating speech education, create awareness uh, concerning the universal that thing that and also we talk more in how can we engage local people at the local level within the, the sector of police, office, office and security. These are some of the key issues which were captured during the session. Another recommendation is to the civil society organization in how best in how best they can localize and how best they can implement in certain spies at their organizational level. How best they can support local women who are doing amazing work at the local level. How best we can promote local to go, uh, a local action for, uh, for global engagement. So these are some of the issues we, we managed to document during, during the session, which were focused more in in advocacy issues, in, in policy and in, in legal matter, and also awareness creation matters of just access to, to, to young, to young girls and women who have been affected by issues of sexual violence at the local level, regional and uh, global level. Our next part was more of engagement of government. We also asked ourselves what's the role of sex actors in the actualization of, of, of this uh, resolution. And these were some of the key recommendations with which were raised during our virtual workshop last year. As you can see them, we all they give more direction of how governments can, can, can step in and support the role of men in the of the security. Yeah, thank you. So this was just brief uh, of the presentation concerning the, uh, the policy brief, and uh, this is what it entails. Now, our next step, we will welcome our special guest who will be joining to trigger more conversation, to share their experience, expertise, and gain us more in how we can use this document as a tool for advocacy purpose and share with, with us their experience in what they're doing within their organization and also within their field of work. So I will stop share my screen. So for, for our special guests, we managed to 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 uh, we managed to lay them into 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 specific recommendation. They will they will they will join and share their perspective, focusing in a specific recommendation. So our first person who we take over is Velma, Velma from Conflict Research Center. Sorry, Vel, uh, Velma Sarif from Post Conflict Research Center. So Velma, we'll, uh, I will focus more in recommendation one to the women. Velma, you have a maximum of 10 minutes to share. You're most welcome. 
Thank you so much, Harun. Thank you so much for the invitation and possibility to participate in this important research. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to connect with you, with all these incredible organizations. Hello, Zaman. Zaman is my colleague from uh, Robert Bosch program. It's a great to see you. Thank you for the invitation. And there is also one more special colleague present right now, which is Elsa. I know Elsa through a bunch of different programs. So I'm happy to see you all and thank you for the invitation. So yes, we have been participating in your project, supporting this research and supporting general this whole project, because we do believe that there are some experiences which we are carrying from the region of Western Balkans, especially Bosnia. So during the research, <clears throat> I was focusing mostly on preventing sexual violence in conflict because unfortunately 20, 25 years ago, my country went through severe war which was really affecting um, thousands of women. According to official data of United Nations, uh, between 20 and 50,000 women in, uh, in Bosnia went through rape or sexual violence. And we do carrying a lot of, a lot of important lessons and knowledge from these horrible experiences. So I was mostly talking about the certain initiatives and the policies and activities which can be done in the prevention, and also I was trying to focus my uh, my my part of, of, of interviewing and helping this project through sharing some good practices and some good results, which uh, Bosnia actually have in this field. So uh, the first thing I would like to mention, and which I think it's really really useful, is initiative being done by uh, the British government, which have a name, the whole initiative have a name, preventing sexual violence in conflict. Um, actually from the work which British government did in the last, I would say probably uh, 10 years now, because they work extensively in this field, there is incredibly important document, which is a protocol uh, international protocol, how to document and how to actually like gain uh, informations about the sexual violence in conflict. This protocol is a set of documents and recommendations, and it's really, really important tool uh, which can help uh, grassroots organizations and human rights activists through all around the world and give them a basic but important knowledge, first of all, in a field of how to document sexual violence in conflict. This came through experience which Bosnia had. Unfortunately, 20 years after the crime would happen to these women, they would struggle mostly to prove that they have been victims of sexual violence and rape. We had a lot of issues where, where these poor women, they would have to come and find the witnesses or they would have to go and look for evidences that they can prove that they have been victims of sexual violence. And it was a real struggle. Why we did this is because we had we had an enormous problem how to actually get reparations, how these women can actually get reparations from the governments, from those who committed crimes against them. So uh, I would definitely, you know, with all of you who are interested, that I think I share with you your colleague who this protocol and I'm going to share a couple of examples how post-conflict research center working closely with the British government and British embassy here in BIH actually incorporate this a law legal document this protocol into multimedia educational program and project helping us to release this through a much more interesting perspective and we incorporate the launching of this protocol and and, and raising awareness about this protocol uh, through a um, multimedia approach where, we're where we were using a photography exhibition, a film as a tool, uh, a lot of discussions with a woman mostly, but also with a man, because man has to be educated a lot about this, about this topic. Unfortunately, you know, 25 years ago here in Bosnia in the region of Western Balkans, um, the men were committing these crimes against women. So we were, we were, we were looking men as a specific and important category which need to be educated, especially young men. 
So this is something what I was trying to share and also uh, explain how important it is to be kind of prepared and educated about documenting sexual violence, uh, uh, like not just in, in, in war. We, we are, there is a part speaking about domestic violence, which is also a large and huge problem among, among uh, uh, general worldwide population. And there is a lot of things which can be replicated in a daily life. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a grassroots work, in non-governmental work. So I'm highly recommending this document, this protocol as a tool which is existing. It's a global approach. It's really replicable all around the world. And we are kind of proud in Bosnia that we have been able to contribute and, 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 and actually create this tool other parts of the world and, and, and document sexual violence in, in, in conflict. The second thing which I want to mention and what I was like kind of trying to highlight is the role of religious leaders in, in, in this process. We did find religious leaders in extremely important uh, helping us to raise stigma, to, to, to break the stigma and silence related to sexual violence and crime. As maybe some of you know, we are living in a country with um, a bunch of different nationalities and religious group, but majority are Bosnian Muslims and um, a, a Serb Orthodox and Catholic Croats. So we do struggle a lot with the three, um, three narratives, conflicting narratives about recent war. And the religious leaders, they really had important role in, in raising awareness about breaking stigma and silence related to sexual violence and crime. Recently, again, under the leadership of British government, we had, I would say, historical declaration being, being published by our, uh, by our interreligious council in the IH. The religious leaders uh, 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 did this declaration and they were, they were inviting uh, 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 international governments and international community, but also local governments, general population, to stop to stigmatize the women victims of sexual violence and actually help them to rehabilitate and return to our society. This is also a really global declaration and, and interreligious council is hoping that this can be also kind of a lead in replication. So there are things very important and some lessons very important related to sexual violence and crime. I'm going to mention, I don't know how I'm with time, but I'm just going to mention one more way how we are actually engaging women and trying to kind of create a platform because one of the recommendation is like necessity for uh, you know networking and raising awareness and, and creating different platforms. So Post-Conflict Research Center have a special project with the name Balkan Discourse, which is pan-ethnic, I would say youth platform, uh, which we specially created for youth voices that they can be heard, but majority of, 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 of our trainees are actually women and young, young, young girls who have been trained in the basic citizenship journalistic skills and the photography skills. And they go to specialized training a week and then they stay in our network for a minimum year through mentorship process. They are able to publish their own stories without censorship, the stories which usually would never be in, 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 a, you know, in, in general public published. And it's a grassroots work. We have up till now, uh, I think uh, more than 50 different cities through all BIH being included. And if you take a look at Balkan discourse, you can see that we are dealing a lot and that we are writing a lot about the, 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 the women rights and, and all these, um, is actually our way uh, of, of fighting against gender segregation because uh, BIH is also struggling a lot with the women representation in the politics. Uh, for example, 10 years ago, I think during the elections, maybe it's not even better now, but 10 years ago, for example, we were at the same level like Saudi Arabia with the women representation in the parliament. I think it's now a little bit better, but it's not so significant. Um, beside, uh, there is also a, a, a large problem with, uh, with domestic violence being put it under the carpet, um, a lot of discrimination going on. So um, we are trying to actually promote women voices through different tools we have. I can share some projects, one of them also being kind of closely uh, related to preventing sexual violence in conflict is our a, a large outdoor photographic exhibition, My Body of War Zone, 
My Body of Warzone is featuring stories about sexual violence and rape from four different countries, from four different uh, uh, continents. So we have stories from BIH from all sides, but we also have stories from Darfur, we have stories from Congo, we have stories from, um, I don't know, which is like the fourth country, but what is important and what I want to mention is that for post-conflict research center, um, the whole work we did through years never been, never been focused locally on BIH. It's always been a global approach. So for us, it's important to educate young people into these global issues and problems. And it's much more easier for young people from BIH if they learn that, for example, rape uh, is something about didn't happen just in Bosnia, but it's currently happening somewhere maybe in Syria. And they can see these examples from Congo because then they can relate much more better and stay distant from their own experience. So I think for all of us it's important to, you know, especially uh, human rights activists and, and, and civil society to stick together and see uh, what kind of good examples and practices we have, what we can share, how can we, uh, promote these issues better and how can we, you know, raise awareness about this document and important work which you are doing. So I will stop here and, and i probably good with time. I don't know. I never measure time. But thank you so much one more time for the invitation. Thank, thank you so much, Velma. We uh, highly appreciate for, for, your, for, your, for your quick input. So our next person, we will welcome uh, Gerard Asho from Arib International. Uh, he will focus more in recommendation to the men. So Gerard Asho, you're most welcome. He will focus more to, to, to tell us the role of men in the in the in the implementation and the actualization of industrial interest rates. Asho, you're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harun, and thank you for the organizers and the invitation. Uh, hi, I'm Gerard. I work for Arigato International in Nairobi. Uh, my experience, what I'll be sharing today based on my experience on uh, implementing a project on ending sexual and gender-based violence in conflict and post-conflict societies. And uh, also based on research, my research interest, which is on women, peace and security agenda. I will first of all try to begin by presenting a scenario to you. Uh, I take an example that Harun and myself are fighting. And then you come into the to, 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 to reconcile us. You notice that I was the one who, who started the conflict. I was the one who attacked Harun. Harun was simply, let's say, doing self-defense. And in the process of conflict resolution or how in your effort to reconcile the conflict, you relegate me to the background and focus on reconciling with Harun. How practical do you think you are going to resolve the conflict? And this comes to my point of the, the, the issue of men not being part of the conversation around women, peace and security. It is often misunderstood in many contexts, especially in Africa, where uh, some people, I don't know if it's misconception, tend to interpret uh, Resolution 1325 as an issue of men against women. But that is not the truth. That is not the reality. The reality is we, the, the resolution needs both men and women for its effective implementation. If we have identified in the context of Africa, we identify patriarchy uh, as one of those systems that have been created to undermine women and limit women participation at decision level making at all processes. So why can't we engage men in, the, in that conversation to see how we can begin to reform and bring about these necessary changes? When, when you look at uh, the national action plans of countries in Africa on the implementation of this particular resolution, it's unfortunate that you, you find yourself feeling like this action plan was just copy pasted from the action plan of England or Netherlands or Australia or Germany. Because 
it makes it feel like Africa is simply a recipient of norms and, and, and regulations which have developed somewhere else and we simply bring them here without reflecting how we can make that to our, how can we put these norms to reflect the realities of our countries and our societies. And I think one thing I noticed in the policy brief which caught my attention was the idea of, of contextualization. I will not necessarily use the word contextualization, but I will use the word localization. How can the resolution be localized to reflect the realities of the African people, to reflect the realities of the people in Kenya? And for that resolution to, to be localized, how can we bring on men and women on board as equal partners in the implementation of the resolution? And I think uh, this is a very important point because there are still many communities uh, in, in, in Africa where men and women are not accepted or allowed to sit on the same table to discuss certain issues. But how can we still even within those communities localize the resolution in such a way that the voices of men are also contributing to speak against gender-based violence, to speak against uh, uh, the, the marginalization and neglect of women, to promote the inclusion of women in peace and security processes. It's important. And one of the strategies that is beginning to work recently in many parts of Africa, especially in DRC Congo, is the idea of promoting male champions. How can going into a community get talking to the men, let's say a rural village, a rural community, you meet men, you talk to them, explain to them the importance of listening to women, the, the disadvantage of beating your wife, the importance of allowing your wife work to contribute to the growth of your family. In it, changing attitudes and mindset takes time, but it's a, something that can be achieved over a, a period of time. And with that, with that particular period, UNICEF has used that strategy. Even us at Regato International, we have used that strategy. Over a, a different, over a period of time, you realize men start talking to other men about the importance of working together with women for the peace and reconciliation of their communities. It is important that as most of us, including myself, we work with communities. We work at the grassroots. In some contexts, our, our partners on the ground or in most communities, the people we work with have not gone to school, they have not been educated. How can <clears throat> the resolution be simplified to explain to my grandfather in the village who did not even, who, who cannot read or write, how can I explain that resolution to him on the values that are within the framework to help protect the interests of, 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 of women within communities. And I think uh, uh, in re the recommendation, as they said, I talk about recommendation for men, one of the focus should be, in, in, especially in our country, should be how can we transform norms? All societies have gender norms, and it is these norms that are either marginalizing or preventing women from effectively part participating in the decision making processes. It is these norms that have given men the, the latitude to beat women. It is these norms that have given men the courage to rape women. So it, rather than focusing so much of our attention on, on, on trying to say it is a debate between women empowerment or it is a debate between men and women, how can we not channel our energy of transforming these gender norms that are the very basic, at the very root of what we are experiencing in terms of, 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 of um, in terms of marginalization or, or the lack of the implementation of the resolution thereof. So one, one of those recommendations that I can make is men are equal partners in implementing the resolution. It is therefore imperative to ensure that for effective implementation of 1325, it's imperative to ensure that both men and women are part of that process at the community levels, at the policy levels, and even at the regional and continental levels. Two, we need to localize the resolution. 
resolution needs to reflect the realities of the people on the ground. And I think it, they should be, this should also guide the reflection of the developers of the policy brief, which is excellent. There is a lot of conversations around capacity building. We need to identify what is the capacity building for. We cannot be doing capacity building because we are supposed to do capacity building. Capacity building is supposed to be meant towards something. And if it's capacity building to ensure women are part of uh, decision-making processes, then the capacity building cannot target just women because women are, are not voting themselves into, into political positions. Then which means you are, we are supposed to educate the communities on the importance of the women leadership, not just limiting the, our efforts to educating women alone. So those are some of the things that we need to come out with clear in the policy brief. When we talk of capacity building, how is it? What, what kind of capacity building are we talking about? Is it targeted capacity building or it is capacity building that in, uh, covers everyone? And I think the, the last point is our advocacy strategy, which we need to come out with this advocacy strategy. I expect to see more probably well moving forward is which agencies are we targeting? It has to be clear. Advocacy does not target everyone. It is strategic to target institutions that can help in promoting the implementation and localization of uh, uh, resolution 1325. So we need to be able to identify that. And for that to happen, it, we need to go back to the drawing board to look at what I've just said about which areas of capacity building are we struggling to empower? We can build the capacities of women to, we can, these days the whole conversation is girl education, girls going to school. We can build capacities for women to uh, professional trainings and everything. But if the norms and traditions and cultures that have marginalized women for a long time are not transformed in a way that embraces uh, gender equality, then no amount of capacity building is going to make any meaningful change as far as the implementing uh, 1325 is concerned. So Harun, I may come back if there are any questions, but I think I can leave it here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gerard uh, Acho from Argat International. We are highly appreciate for you uh, for for your inputs and key uh, and key issues to emphasize in. Uh, our next person on stage uh, is Rachel Wainaina from Youth Feeling Platform, uh, Youth Feeling Platform Africa. Rachel will focus more in in, in recommendation to the community. So she has she has experience in media and and filming sector. So she also share uh, the importance of storytelling in the, in the, in the actualization of the uh, entire uh, Rachel Wainaina. Sorry, Thank uh, you. Rachel Thank Wainaina. Most welcome. Rachel Wainaina, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, um, Karen, and thank you to the organizers um, for the invitation to participate in this wonderful session. And um, today, um, first of all, let me just introduce myself real quick. Yeah, uh, I work for Youth Film Platform Africa, which is an organization that empowers the youth with practical and professional skills in multimedia. So the skills are then used for income generation and social self-expression. But I also wear many hats. Um, recently, we started a program. It's called Saudi Kenya Program, which is empowering women actually in promoting peace, security, and governance issues. And I also am in mean, the Mandela Washington Fellowship uh, Alumni Association, through which we've also uh, had various initiatives uh, concerning peace uh, and security, especially when it relates to women. So today, I just want to say first that I've gone through the policy document and I've seen uh, very good recommendations that came out of it. And I just want to highlight some of our work that has actually touched on some of the recommendations that I read, especially when it comes to community. Now, when you look at the community level, there are, uh, the things that we have identified from our work is that women voices, apart from you know the, the lack of inclusion on a national level, some of the main uh, women leaders in the grassroots, their voices have been muted. 
they've not gotten enough time to enough air time in the media to highlight the majority of the population in Kenya and I'm sure in many places as well. And so they should, they deserve a right to be on the table. Also, women are naturally gifted when it comes to, you know, uh, the issue of having conflicts. Uh, women are very good, actually, problem solvers, but they've not been involved. That potential of women has not been tapped. And also, there's a shortage of case studies. And also believe in the ability of women to lead. So uh, there's a need to strengthen the voices of women, you know, in, in our society so that then, you know, even the communities can continue to believe more in the good potential and the work that women can do. So in our program, some of the things that we've been, we've been doing, and I'm happy to hear some of the speakers also have talked about it, is citizen journalism. So we've used citizen journalism as a tool of giving women a voice where women are now able to use several self-publishing tools to actually also talk about their stories. Uh, citizen journalism, of course, is uh, something that does not require so much training, uh, that empowers women to use the tools, like their phone, uh, to record a sound, a mobile application, and actually be able to tell the stories that are happening in their community. Now, as a filmmaker, I'll tell you one thing, that when it comes to peace building, we are talking about various topics like countering violent extremism. Now, not many people are very free to talk about, you know, these issues or to report about them. But with the use of multimedia tools, uh, you know, people can be able to actually report about this without necessarily exposing themselves. So citizen journalism offers that kind of platform. Two, citizen journalism, as uh, one of the speakers also said, gives an opportunity such that women are actually being given an opportunity to publish their work without so much editorial bureaucracy and distortion of the stories that they're telling. And these are skills that they can do uh, or use using the small tools that they have. The other area which we are working in in promoting dialogue is also promoting the skills in organizational sustainability, coming up, trying to run their organization and they need some skills, uh, how to pitch, which organizations to work with, how to build a program that works for them. Because we believe um, that sometimes also as women, we need to invest in ourselves so that we can come out from uh, at that leadership level. So in organizational sustainability, we are looking at how can you really build sustainable programs that really become helpful for the communities as well. And then in terms of theater, using theater as a tool of a design, try to show the community how you feel and in what you, through choral verses, through music, spoken word, or even actually also through plays. And, and these days we are doing both digital plays and we, we can also do live plays in front of communities. Again, this, this kind of tools help people to actually amplify the dialogue of how, how women, you know, women, um, uh, what the challenges that women are facing in communities. So in another area that we're working with is using film as a tool for also amplifying the voices of women and the challenges that women go through. And on a larger scope, also identifying the uh, highlighting big issues like the issues of uh, violent extremism, political extreme, you know, political radicalization of the youth and such things. So currently we are making a feature length film. It's called Wounds and we'll be shooting uh, starting in June. And in the feature length film, we're going to be covering, you know, people
get radical art translate into the disasters that we are seeing in our homes in different places today. So that's another thing that we are doing. Now, what, what is the most important thing when it comes to doing a capacity uh, building program that will actually promote dialogue in our communities? One of the things is um, the way you put the program together should be in a very practical and experiential way in such a way that the participants of these programs or the beneficiaries are actually able to take home some skills that they can use to enhance their advocacy work and to enhance their voice and to get their voice heard. So, for instance, when you look at the work we've been doing through Mandela Washington Fellowship Alumni Association, one of the jobs we've been doing is bringing these people on online shows together with their communities and letting them talk live with the audience and engage in different conversations, ranging from domestic violence against women and other things, and to involving men in the process of these discussions. That's one of the things that we've been doing. The other thing we've been doing is hosting film festivals that promote the issue of women in governance, peace, security, and governance. And uh, so just bringing this content so that we can create awareness to the community of some of the challenges that are, are, are happening and, and that we hope can cut the right uh, eyes and convince other people in the community to do the same thing. So through the Mandela Washington Fellowship Alumni Association, we've also been able to go to the ground in five counties. And during that time, we engaged with different communities trying to understand, for instance, what is this, the cause of political radicalization? Like in Kibra, uh, which is one of the biggest slums in Africa and in Kenya as well. Uh, we went there and we were able to see the communication gaps that are there between the young people and the government. Also, we, we, we looked at the issue of culture and how the interpretation of culture has affected women when it comes to them being on an equal platform when they're trying to express their needs and trying to solve their problems. So those are some of the programs that we have also been able to engage with. The film festival for me is very, very important because it also serves as a benchmarking platform where you're able to have some a woman submitting the work they are doing from Italy or from France. And a woman from Kenya, from Mombasa or Kisumu or Nairobi is also sharing their story. And in between, when the screening is happening, you're able to learn how you know different countries are coping with this uh, problem that we are trying to address today. So the multisectoral approach uh, uh, was another issue that stood out for me uh, in these recommendations when it comes to community. Yes, uh, it takes a whole community, you know, a whole society to give this right to the women. And so we need to involve the other stakeholders. Um, and as one of the speakers said, we can't just uh, say this is our battle as women and we're just going to use women in this fight. We need to find ways as a society to engage together, sit and discuss. In the, in the, you know, in the past, the African society was organized in a way that men mostly were the ones involved in decision-making. But then how do we, without breaking our culture, breaking families, how do we then now start bringing in the soft discussion in our communities that yes, uh, involving a woman in, in discussions that are happening about uh, does not in any way change her place as a wife or change her place as a mother. It's just like uh, when you bring people together, then we are able to actually complement each other. So having said that, I think that um, some of the best recommendations is promoting dialogues. Uh, within communities, we need to use citizen journalism, which is citizen journalism, and I want to finish my presentation from there. Citizen journalism means that maybe there's a story that is not being told in your community, and you want to get this story told, and because we have a, a lot of digital platforms in our countries. So you can take your phone or you can take any tool that you have, and you can tell that story. That story can help communities. And I'll give one example uh, of somebody who covered a story 
about um, a woman who was living with disability and she was neglected by the family. And she was almost dying because of poverty and alienation and loneliness. When that story was covered, people came together from around the world and they empowered that woman. They contributed money, she, they built a small house for her. She got shelter, clothing, and all that. So let's not um, underestimate the, the power of media and that the power of media has now come also to the citizens. The citizens can be able to use that tool for expressing themselves. So thank you very much, Haron, for inviting me, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rachel, for good submission. We uh, highly appreciate Our next question is, is Betty. Uh, Betty, are you with us? Betty, are you with us? Betty, are you with us? Yeah. Okay, because I cannot hear home, so we will let you to the final song. Uh, Susan Owiro from program, uh, who is the program coordinator at Partnership for Peace and Security. Also, also Susan Owiro is one of the community member of the uh, of Kenya National Action Plan for Kenya Committee. Susan, you are most welcome as you may deliver all recommendations to the government and civil society organization. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity for inviting me. Uh, my name is Susan Owiro Chege. I work with Partnership for Peace and Security. Uh, within Partnership for Peace and Security, we are developing a joint program with the government. We are actually developing a joint, we are working on a joint program with the government on, uh, we've done deepening foundation for peace building in the country. And uh, at the moment, we are also looking at transcending the peace. And our major role at uh, Partnership for Peace and Security is to ensure that we localize UN Security Council 1325 and Youth Peace and Security 2250. Within these processes uh, that we are doing, we've been able to engage with the process of uh, 1325. And uh, one of the key things that uh, I'd like to bring to notice is that the policy document is a very, very good document uh, that you've been able to share. I was keen on looking at issues of national action plan. And uh, when I talk about national action plan, my key is that uh, the presidential, after launching of 1325, what really followed was the UN Security Council that uh, was able to talk about documenting processes or engaging government and securities so that they are able to deal with what we call national action plan or develop gender policies or peace policies or certain policies that can enable them to implement uh, the entire process. So for me, I would like to look at uh, the content of 1325 as a policy. And looking at the content of 1325, looking at the pillars, the participation, which you've explained very, very well. Uh, what I missed was the prevention, prevention beat, the protection beat, relief and recovery. And what comes to my mind is when you develop a national action plan, the key thing is that the national action plan is supposed to fit in within what your country requires. If your country requires an action plan that uh, enables them, to look at more engaging women in terms of participation, then it is very, very important to look at uh, issues of participation. Uh, when I look at the government, one of the things that I may want to begin addressing is that government sit at what we call track one level of mediation. Yet women are within, women are excluded in track one mediation. More women are found in track two, track three mediation processes. Yes, they are found there, but the few women who get to track one mediation process, how do we accompany these women to the track one mediation? Because within the mediation, you influence mediation process within when you sit at the table, when you're within the room, outside the room, or you can be able to engage those who sit at the mediation table 
1325 has actually seen as within the region of Africa, I'll talk about the region of Africa because Kenya reports to the continental results framework, which is under the AU. Under the AU, to improve the mediation process, FEMI-wise has actually increased uh, what we call a training on women mediators across the region of Africa. Arun, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Sorry, lights had just gone off a bit. Uh, so what, what I was saying is that uh, women who sit at the mediation table, they need to be accompanied. We are not accompanying the women. They are lonely above. So 1325, this policy should be able to speak in terms of accompanying the few women who are already sitting at the negotiation table, who are making agreement, we give them, we continuously give them capacity to enable them improve their skill. Uh, the next thing that I'd like to say, apart from accompaniment, is documentation. Documentation of activities that women are doing on the ground in terms of implementing 1325. We are very minimal in terms of documentation, and that's why we are seeing the absence of women within the processes. Women are doing great work in terms of community level mediation. One of the things that we must begin doing to date is to celebrate those milestones. We are not celebrating the milestones. We are not documenting the milestones. And when we are not documenting, we continue to say that they are absent. Because when we are drafting our reports, when we are drafting the reports, we continue to say within those reports that abs women are absent. Can we count the ones that are present? Uh, the next thing that I'd also like to say is 1325 talks about women and girls. A lot of issues that they are addressing is uh, preventing violence against women and girls. Where are the girls within our 1325? Where are we allocating them? Are we allocating them at just that level of to be had? Uh, we have had cases where when you go for training, capacity building, and you engage young women, where there are older women like my age, they feel completely left out. If they go to the youth, they feel left out. So we must be able to use the instruments that, because 2250 sprang from 1325, we must be able to push some of these women uh, at the level of uh, 2250 so that their voices are heard. I know within the region of Africa, there are organizations that are training young women in issues of peace and security. So when their capacity is built, how do we give them spaces where they can do internship, where they can do co-learning, or where they can be accompanied? And government has opportunities. gives an opportunity for any woman when there is a mediation process happening, you can walk into the room, not necessarily say anything, but you have observer status. So long as you come from member state of the countries and you are able to facilitate yourself to get into the space and to get into the room. I think it is those opportunities that uh, we must begin looking out for. Another thing that happens is that when a country develops a national action plan, a national action plan is a tool that helps the government to implement some of those policies that have been passed at the international level and, document, and uh, domesticate them within their countries. Our country, Kenya, for example, is, um, is, is as, as, as signed 1325. And many of those protocols, the CEDO, the Maputo protocol, can we also report in 1325 the way we are reporting under the CSW? CSW, every 
everybody looks forward to CS meetings that were happening in the CSW, and the status of women was being reported. 1325 has that opportunity of reporting progress. Can we also continue looking at strategies of reporting progress? The next thing is that uh, as a government must be committed, we must, when you develop a national action plan, there is what we call the commitment and accountability of the government to ensure that women are protected from gender, gender and sexual based violence. And at the same time, they prevent issues of uh, SGBV within the process and participate. So it is the commitment that the government gets when they sign some of those documents. I'd, I'd like to bring to your notice that Kenya has been working very, very closely in terms of uh, joint programming with the government in implementing UN Security Council 1325. And this joint programming is enabling us ask government to actually put budgetary allocation or look for money to be able to finance some of those activities. As I come from civil society organization, the kind of funding that we get is limited. But uh, one of the things that a government should be able to do is that the gender machinery or the gender ministries or gender departments should be able to get funding to implement this resolution 1325 at large. And when they implement that, they get what we call ownership. Ownership is very, very important in terms of, uh, 13, in, 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 in terms of uh, pushing forward the program. The other thing that uh, we might look at is issues of intergenerational dialogue, issue of uh, accompanying, issues of uh, creating that level of connectivity between YPS and WPS, YPS and WPS, Women, Peace and Security and Youth, Peace and Security. These two, this, this, these two policies, these two documents have similar pillars apart from just one pillar that they do not share. But the pillar on YPS talks about clear partnership. So it is this partnership that we might want to introduce within 1325. The other bit is that the language of 1325 is very polite. It, it's not enforcing. The language of 1325 encourages member states to be able to adopt, to be able to implement, to be able to localize 1325. Member states might not be able to do that without the watchdog position of civil society organizations. I think civil society organizations should also be able to push the governments to push this agenda across. And the next thing is that uh, sometimes women are implementing this resolution 1325 without knowing that they're implementing it on the ground based on the activities that they are doing. And I want to draw an example for uh, an example from Kitui, where I went and I realized that women were saying that we need this kind of development agenda. How do we mainstream it and infuse it within the development agenda? The women were saying that we need access to firewood, we need access to water, because Kitui, we are forced to go into the forest to fetch firewood to look for water. And when we go there, sometimes we get, we, we are attacked, sometimes we meet fate of uh, issues of sexual gender-based violence. So to reduce that sexual gender-based violence, what we are putting in our public participation in our county integrated development plan is that we'd like our county to be able to factor this in, access to water, access to fire, uh, so that uh, women are able to live happily. Uh, so it's very, very important that we look at what is there, what has been done, where have women been able to influence uh, issues of mediation? For example, Kenya states, yes, women are working behind the scenes, but the issues of the women managed to get into the negotiation table where the chief mediator Kofi Annan was able to pick the issues that were affecting the women on the ground. So key is strategy. What are some of those strategies that we are going to adopt to enable us localize 1325 that resonates with each member states, like that resonates uh, with our country 
so that the programs response, the kind of programs that we put responds to the needs of the people and to the needs of the women. So I, I, I don't want to belabor the point of having a NAP because their countries to date do not have NAPs, but they're implementing. Namibia, for example, is one of the countries where 1325 had a unanimous, under the chairmanship of the president of Namibia, that 1325 was passed. But up to 2019, Namibia did not develop a national action plan. The reason being the agenda policy was actually each and every aspect that was within the national action plan. So it's very important that we look at not just 1325, but what are some of those other policies that exist that can be able to help us to push the implementation of this policy across. So I would just end by saying that the key things that we need is documentation, celebration of uh, success stories, documentation of success stories, documentation, mentorship of young women, so that we accompany them to the process, budgetary allocation and joint programming with the government so that we are able to engage them much more so that we can be able to sit at those high level negotiation tables and influence the processes. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you so much, Susan. We highly appreciate for your uh, submission, focusing more in civil society, plus also focusing to the government. So we uh, remain with a few minutes to wind up uh, this session. Now we are opening this dialogue to all the participants. So it's an open dialogue. You can either just raise your hand and talk or unmute yourself and talk, or also you can just use the chat box. So we give plenty of five participants uh, to take this opportunity and either share anything or ask questions. Thank you. So I can I can see Aida from Uganda. Aida. Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Harun, and uh, the presenters. Very great submissions. My name is Aida Bukoboza, and I am a computer scientist by profession, and also very passionate about gender inclusive technology in addressing pertinent issues that affect women and girls towards development. I'm also a Mandela Washington fellow, like um, my Naina. So I'm um, very happy that we have such a consortium and a group of young African leaders, you know, working towards development. My submission, rather, I don't know if it will come in as a comment or a question, is um, there has been too much of talks talked about in regards to um, using multimedia journalism and everything that has been submitted from all the presenters. However, my concern comes in in an intersectional approach for uh, bridging gender gap and innovation. In this sense, I do mean like a person who is, we are using digital platforms right now to make sure that we make uh, these kinds of conversations at a larger and, you know, inclusive level, because I want to appreciate COVID for once to, up, uh, to give us the opportunity to appreciate technology towards advancement and development. So my concern here, where is all this and where do we have how can we embed and engage to make sure we do leverage uh, technology as a bridge to ease access to justice and as a way of, uh, you know, promoting and also um, working towards gender-based violence and also the whole uh, perspective in uh, peace and security for women and girls. Why? Because one, I do believe we have very many online movements that are coming up that are working towards development and making, you know, very great effort to make sure voices of women and girls all over the world are heard. We have seen hashtags moving using digital platforms. And number two, where do we stand as a consortium or as an organization or as peace builders in today's changing world of work that is mainly a digital era work when it comes to online gender-based violence? There is a lot of concern and there is a lot of abuse that limit women's participation in such digital spaces where more that are more are threatened actually to make sure that there is, um, their voices are heard 
physical violence is still a very huge threat to women, but also there is a rampant and uh, very great concern when it comes to online gender-based violence. And also lastly, when it comes to surveillance and privacy, especially for women in leadership, or also people who are into uh, persons of interest when it comes to um, uh, preventing and countering, uh, you know, uh, violence in a sense. So where do we place our conversations when it comes to using such platforms to make sure that we do um, keep women's voices uh, clean and also very protected when it comes to surveillance and protection of women and girls. Yeah, also lastly on this, um, can we also identify about the online use? Those are my submissions and comments. I don't know if someone can answer me in that regard. Thank you so much, Haron. Okay, thank you so much, Aida. So we have Lennox, then we have Andros, then we finalize with Sheila, then finally we we'll give opportunity to, 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 to some of the speakers to respond directly. So kindly, I'm um, requesting if you can take only a maximum of two minutes to, to raise your issue straight forward. Okay, Lennox, you can take over. Uh, uh, th thank you, Arun. Thank you, Arun. Uh, mine, especially on our, our, our champion, and I wanted to emphasize on that that uh, we need to go back to our custodians of our cultural norms, like uh, from our area. We have Kaya elders. We need to engage them in these committees so that they can uh, learn from us and have a different perspective on where the world is heading to vis-a-vis uh, -vis to where they have been coming from so that they don't feel left or uh, maybe losing their originality but we engage them they understand so that we can work together in this journey uh, another insight uh, is about what uh, uh, Rachel Wainaina said uh, she mentioned some a uh, few of activities and I wanted to add on something like uh, we come up with youth extravaganza, but we specifically are based on our agenda so that every young person who wants to be involved in that extravaganza, uh, either he's a poet, a spoken word, uh, artist, uh, um, uh, uh, contemporary dance, and all manner of arts, they can uh, create content in relation to our agenda so that they can start from the grassroots to, to national and international. If we can have all this in place, I am very sure that we will address so many uh, young people who are behind these issues. We can address so many elders uh, through uh, us so that they can understand what we need to do, uh, where we are and where the world has come from and be able to address all these challenges we are facing today. Thank you. Those are my few submissions I wanted to make. Sheila? Harun? Oh. Yes, yes I'm both. Oh, sorry. I was going to ask, should I go next? <laughs> okay, proceed. All right. Thank you very much, Harun. And my apologies to all of you. When I was making the presentation for the policy paper, I think I was locked off. But I have two comments, and I'll be very, very, very brief. My first, um, my first comment really is on the specificity when it comes to the capacity building and this is the re in regard to the position paper section that talks about uh, the capacity building we need to be to be specific about whose capacity are we building and exactly on what because we also need to understand that uh, as much as we're talking about women peace and security women is not a homogeneous group and what a certain group of women will require is not uh, the same thing that 
the other group of women may require. And then the other thing is how best do we link local interventions to global, uh, to global, uh, to global resolutions in terms of documentation of the local work being done by local uh, peace builders in connection to the to the UN resolution and this I also concur with with the speaker who said there are lot there's a lot of work being done on WPS and YP Yes, but there's no clear documentation of it. And she gave an example of, of, of Kitui. But also the other thing for me that I felt that lacked in the position paper in terms of the participation pillar of WPS then is uh, part, uh, participation of young women in, polit in politics or, or public processes where we've Previously, we've seen gaps such as lack of political mentorship within the political parties. And when we talk about participation of young women, we mean those who are already are in political parties and those who are aspiring to be within the political party. And then lastly is the issue of digital divide the digital divide and election, especially for peace builders. When you talk about the digital divide, the people who are mostly affected are women. When you talk about tech assisted violence, the, 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 the people who are mostly affected are equally women. So how do we factor in the issues of protection, not just on surveillance, but even capacity gaps to actually engage online because We've seen reports indicating that the number of uh, women engaging online are very minimal. And in relation to the peace builders context, I feel like it is even worse for you when you're a, when you're a peace builder. Then lastly, I would like to point out that um, as much as we have the, the, the position paper, how do we contextualize what works best for our region? For example, we developed a position paper at Uzalendo Africa Initiative where we're trying to look at the status of the implementation of YPS and WPS as the, at the coastal region, because at least we thought we could start from a point where, where it is at the grassroots, and then we can try and see if these are the same challenges that the rest of the country is facing. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry if I took three minutes instead of two. <laughs> Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Sheila Salim. I work for Youth for Sustainable Development, and I'm also one of the program participants for Saudi Kenya program. So just two inputs. One, it's very clear that art plays a big role in matters peace and security. So I feel that we need to further elaborate and also define how arts can be used as a critical component in bridging the gap between peace and insecurities in our communities. And then also another thing that has also I've seen has come up a lot is the use of technology. So we also need again to define what are the lines and what are the barriers of ensuring that women really use the technology very well and effectively. For example, citizen journalism for women on the ground in our local grassroots in monitoring and also in prevention of violent extremism and then issues of peace insecurity. So those are just my two submissions. Thank you. Uh, can I go? Uh, can I speak? Can I? Can I speak? Yes, Halima, proceed. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Halima Mohammed. I work for Coastal Education Center, and um, I'm glad that we have fellows of um, Mandela fellows here. Um, uh, looking at the policy, for me, I'm, I'm, uh, I have two issues. One is looking at the prevention, and basically not looking at, uh, especially in 1325, not only on general women, but again on women peace builders, which have actually been left out on all these discussions. Women peace builders play a very critical role, and uh, I think when you look at prevention should also include women peace builders who are at the front when it comes to violence and conflict. Two, I'm looking at also a recognition of women peace builders. How do we ensure that they are also recognized? Because um, when we look at peace building, yes, the issues of peace are paramount and everybody else is included. But again, to me, it's women peace builders per se. How do we ensure the recognition of women peace builders across the globe, also in the country? And three, I'm looking at appreciation. How do we ensure that we appreciate the work that is being done on the ground, on the 47 counties, at the globe and everywhere, where women are, are playing critical role? 
13 to 5 years is talking about the prevention, but, but not including the women peace builders, human rights defenders. To me, I think it's an issue that we needs to be taken across, needs to be debated, and needs to be an, an all-inclusive policy. So as women peace builders can be included in all this uh, uh, policy. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank you thank you so much, Halima. So now we we'll give space for for the for the for the speaker to share just uh, just the opinion for maximum of two minutes each. Anyone who would like to share for the rest of the participants, if you want to share anything, you can just use a chat box. So I can see so you know, you have raised your hand. You can proceed. Maximum of two uh, minutes. Uh, thank Thank you, thank you very much. I'd, I'd, I'd like to look at uh, three issues. Uh, one of them that I'd like to look at is, is issues of technology, uh, opportunity of working very closely with government. We see it in what we call uh, gender sector working group and uh, women peace and security working group under the State Department of Gender within Kenya. And uh, we also have the National Steering Committee on Peace Building and Conflict Management. Uh, last year, and early this year, actually, we've, be, we've, had, uh, we've been able to engage a toll-free line 1195 that deals with issues of uh, SGBV, where you are able to report, they rescue, they do telecounseling and reintegration back into the community, especially for the women. And they're also doing it for the men as a contribution of 1325. This year around International Women's Day, we were able to launch a, 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 an, an app, which we call Commercial Dulma app, where you are able to report issues of SGBV online, anonymous, and uh, they, are, they are acted upon. And uh, the other bit is working on issues of safe houses. They are, uh, the government plus civil society have been able to come up with what we call safe houses, especially with this COVID-19 period, where we had uh, the increase of SGBV, and many women did not know where to go, especially because of the lockdown. We had that opportunity, but a lot of it was coming through technology. We were levering on, leveraging on technology because there's, there's one of the things that we developed that is any woman, we had a WhatsApp group where you would be able to put in, uh, you know, the different colors of love. If you are in danger, you put red. You, you, you sent a red on the WhatsApp and somebody looks out for you and rescues you wherever you are, especially on the issues of uh, SGBV as a 1325 mechanism to be able to address that. Uh, the other bit, there's somebody who was talking about um, issues of women peace builders. We have the global network of women peace builders that is supporting women peace builders across, across the globe. Last year, uh, last year, we were able to do round table discussion on 1325 and support of women peace builders uh, we had a meeting with Global Network of Women Peace Builders in, in Austria and another one that was held in Malaysia in Penang. These were mainly, one was done by Commonwealth and the other one was done by Global Network of Women, women Peace Builders to look at strategies of how do we support women peace builders trauma healing because sometimes they go through those traumas. Uh, the last bit that I would also want to share is issues of uh, women in security women who are working in the military, women who are working in uh, security sector regions that 1325 covers. Kenya, uh, I would want to say that uh, when you elect a woman at the top, like a cabinet secretary, it is very important that if we are doing 1325, can we be able to engage them so that they, they, they have informed choices of pushing the policy? And uh, one of the things that happened is that when we had a woman at the helm of the military, the, the Department of Defense, Kenya was able to develop a, a one of its kind gender policy for the military, which is being adopted within the region of Africa, that we are saying that it is a plus for us. And the other bit is uh, the standard operating procedures that was also done in the police service. So there are things that are happening. And I think either it is, uh, they're, they're being documented, but, uh, maybe we are not doing a lot of sensitization so that people know that these activities are happening, that they are out there in the public and people are able to engage with them. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much. Any other speaker who, who would like to share opinion before we, we, we finalize? Any other person? Okay, Rachel. Uh, sorry for Fatuma Aida. We want to give more time. You can just use chat box to share your opinion because we are out of time. So Rachel, take over. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I just wanted to respond to the question of how can art be used on the ground by, you know, to enhance the visibility of women and the documentation of women's work. I think one way that we can use art uh, when it comes like to citizen journalism is for documentation of actually what is happening in the society. Today, if you have a phone which has full HD, like the phone that I'm using right now, you're able to actually even produce a film that can be shown on any TV station. That's how easy it's become. With an Android phone, you're able to actually do a lot. So you need just to make sure that you know how you're going to capture your sound and how you're going to capture your picture. And then you can be able to document. Also, you can create visibility for the work that you're doing and get it to more audiences. You can also use online platform. Uh, like uh, nowadays we have good apps like Zoom, we have StreamYard app where you're able to bring panelists from different parts of the world to also be able to share your stories. You can also use podcasts. If you don't feel comfortable exposing your face um, to people when you're talking, you can just use your voice and you can reach a lot of people through podcasting. Then there's also the issue of using theater, which is, you know, theater is very entertaining because it's a performance in front of a live audience. So you're able to pick up very weighty matters that you want to address and address them through theater. If I was to give quick examples of how citizen journalism is being used currently. Okay, so a, a few months ago, we had the Black Lives Matter campaign in which the mainstream media actually shut down that campaign so people were using their mobile phones to actually broadcast live and tell us what is happening in different countries when it comes to the black lives matter campaign as well then also if you look at the situation of palestine and israel right now again people are using a lot of you know phone recording and sharing of images that's how we are getting the real situation on the ground also, there's a lot of other forms of art using posters to pass messaging. So you can also use um, art for messaging, for putting across a particular message that you want, and also for prevention of something that could have happened, also for fundraising and for your organizational sustainability, where you can record the work you're doing and ask the community to join you and help you to further enhance your work. And Ida was asking how to use online platforms. As I was saying, uh, I've been using the online platforms myself. And just in the last one week, uh, we did like four live shows, which we were able to reach 12,000 people from seven countries in Africa. So the online space, the social media, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok is coming up very well. Again, it depends with your target audience, then you'll be able to actually uh, reach so many people with the work that you're doing. And that's the one of the ways that people are going to see the work that women are doing on the ground. Thank you very much, Harold. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your time and for participating in this session. So finally, we will welcome Elsa to give a final remark. Elsa, thank you, Harun. Thank you, Harun, and good evening from Mumbai, India. And I really want to appreciate Harun and Zaman and the rest of the team because I saw their journey from last year and what they've been able to achieve through mobilizing this community has been incredible. Um, I would encourage everyone to read the report and uh, you know submit your insights. Just a little bit about me and uh, to all the tech questions. I'm the founder of Red Dot Foundation. Our flagship program is Safe City, which is a crowd map for sexual and gender-based violence. I launched this about eight years ago in response to a horrific gang rape that took place in India, where a young woman lost her life. And at that time, nobody understood the uh, importance of crowd mapping and crowdsource data. But subsequently, we have shown how anonymous reporting actually encourages many uh, survivors to come forward and break the silence, which is um, reinforced with shame, taboo, and uh, 
you know, the fear of being a victim. And um, secondly, the data. So every story goes into this database and we are able to see the trends and patterns at the neighborhood level. And this data is given back to the community in an open source format, which also helps in the agency in trying to decide for themselves what should be the solutions. And not all solutions require policing. A lot of it can be use of religious leaders, like Velma said. Religious leaders uh, play a great role in communities, um, you know, elders. Also these stories, because of the silence around it, uh, we don't talk about it. So we don't understand the various nature of sexual harassment, sexual violence, what are the contributing factors apart from patriarchy. And by um, understanding the localized context, you can definitely bring in more people to talk about it, but shift the spotlight from the survivor to really how can we as a society uh, deal with it or address it. And that is where the role of men come in. Uh, much has been said about the role of men, but I do believe a lot of education is required. Men have, uh, so the men in this group are really sensitive and it, you can be pure leaders modeling, modeling good behavior to your counterparts. And whilst it's frightening because it's the start, you know, where uh, you don't have critical mass, it will pick up a lot of free tools. I, you know, if you're following the COVID crisis in India, the government failed terribly. It was the citizens who mobilized on Twitter for immediate help and got oxygen and other medical uh, facilities to people, normal people. Okay, so I think if we can collectively think about solutions, can framing gender norms, I think we also have to reframe how we think of leaders. Uh, if I had to ask any one of you, who is your, you know, the most, most of you would say your mother, your grandmother. And why is that? Because your earliest caregivers are your female uh, folk in the family, and they are leaders. Think of a crisis. Who's the first one to rush with food or, you know, to console or to bring resources to the community? It's the women. They have the intelligence. They just don't have the confidence. So I think we can amplify these stories. Again, social media is a great way to put a spotlight on it. Amplify these stories. Uh, celebrate women. Um, encourage women. Mentor them. And of course, mentor young people, both, both men and women. But I think you should, we should invest a little more in women because uh, they, it's not equal at the moment, right? So I just wanted to put those thoughts on the table and I'm really, really impressed with what you've been able to achieve, uh, Harun and Zaman. So thank you everyone and thank you for having me. And you may contact me, I'll put my email in the chat section. Hello everyone. Thank you everyone for joining this conversation. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you to all our special guests for joining this conversation. We will share this record by your email um, in the next few hours or by tomorrow. Thank you, thank you so much. We can keep uh, this conversation on going in Twitter, share your thoughts, share your key, key takeaways, and tag us at Global Peace Champions, both LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. You're free to tag us. So at this moment, you, uh, we can just end this meeting. So just to share announcement, our next session will be next week Thursday. We will have a book review for our global peace chapter conference. Last year we hosted a virtual conference and we managed to bring more than 30 
uh, more than 30 speakers from different countries. And we develop a collection of articles and different papers in a book format. So next week we will review this book. Then in uh, next month on six, we are planning to announce our next phase and our key areas of focus for the next conference. Thank you so much, and see you soon in the next few days. Thank you. So you can just do a quick checkout by sharing your key takeaways for this session. Thank you. Just see the chat and do a quick checkout by sharing your key takeaway. Thank you. Sorry, Harun, I didn't you. Sorry, Fatuma. I didn't get you what you were saying. <laughs>